Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Blau. Nice to see everybody and welcome to our panel today, A Journalist's View on XR. I'm excited to be here today because we've got a great panel. We'll introduce them in just a second. And today we're going to talk about all things sort of flipped around from the sort of situation that's normal. And by the way, the screens went out here, so if you could put them back, that'd be great. Uh, and the timer, too. Uh, but first up, I just want to tell you briefly about myself. I'm Brian. I'm Research Vice President at Gartner. Uh, I'm a technology analyst where I cover all types of personal technologies. Augmented reality and virtual reality have been in my own personal background for many years, going back to the late 1980s. I was working in the VR field in the 90s and in the 2000s and beyond. I became an analyst and I'm not covering it full time. In addition, I cover other personal technologies uh, like smartphones, tablets, apps, uh, et cetera. But I'm passionate about graphics, I'm passionate about interactivity, and I'm passionate about immersion. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. So with me out of the way, I wanted to let the panelists uh, introduce themselves. So maybe we'll just uh, go right down the line and uh, just say who you are, uh, publication sure. that you're working with, and a bit about what you're covering. Uh, my name is Charlie Fink. I cover AR and VR for Forbes. I also am the author of uh, a nonfiction bestseller called Charlie Fink's Metaverse, an AR-enabled guide to VR and AR. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you it's for high. coming. Sorry. Hey, I'm Rachel Metz. Um, I write for MIT Technology Review. Um, I cover uh, the intersection of humans and machines. I, I, in a general sense, cover what it means for us to be constantly connected to devices, either in the future, permanently perhaps, um, or things that we're using today that keep us constantly connected. So uh, VR, AR, wearable technology, smartphones, all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, I'm Mark Gurman. I cover Apple and consumer technology products for Bloomberg News. And uh, honored to be here on this panel, these great folks. So thanks for having me. So I think you can see here, uh, if you read the news, check out the media, read columns and books, you're going to know these panelists, you're going to know their publications. And today I think we're going to get an interesting take, as I said, sort of from the flip side uh, of the market. And what I mean by that is this, simply as an analyst uh, in the industry, usually uh, the reporters in the press uh, call analysts like myself for comments, maybe an inside track, something like that. But today, I have the great honor of flipping this around. I get a chance to ask them something, uh, things that I'm personally interested in. I'm really curious about their process. I'm curious about how they figure out what they find. I'm curious about what they know, the secrets. Um, and even their own views, because they have a chance to look at this market in a way that you and I uh, oftentimes don't, because they talk to so many of you, and they really have a really good understanding of what's there. But for me, um, the topics on the panel today are going to sort of focus on the market, uh, their process. But what's important for me, and especially at, the, at this show, is the fact, and I have to say, and I don't know how many here, if you've been to Augmented World Expo before, AWE, in previous years, you'll notice one thing that's quite different this year. And this year, it's been my observation that AWE and augmented reality has grown up. Last year and previous years, and not this, that the show wasn't great and well attended, but clearly there's a lot more vendors on the show floor. The attendance figures are up. The names and the brands on, uh, in the booths uh, from big businesses around the world using augmented reality is significantly more than it has been in previous years. There's a lot of new startups, but maybe the most significant thing is a lot of new products and ideas uh, that we're seeing. Uh, that's great. It's part of the problem because how do these products make money? Uh, that's one of the things uh, that we're going to ask the panelists. And I really want to start off with that. And my first sort of question to the panelists here, and it's really about the sort of the elephant in the room. It's been mentioned in panels and sessions before, but we know very well on the other side of the immersion house, on the virtual reality side, that sales of head-mounted displays aren't great. Certainly, there's some new products like uh, the uh, Oculus Go, inexpensive VR headset. But in, across the board, VR hasn't been as big a success as I think everyone has hoped. Now, the question is, is there going to be a bleed over? Is there something wrong with immersive technology in your opinion? Is there a reason that it's being sort of held back? Is it similar to VR? And from that journalist and columnist 
standpoint, when you take a look at it at the high level, just give us some observations about why it's been difficult and maybe uh, talk about a little bit on the future and maybe you'll comment on how long you think it's going to take. But Charlie, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. Well, I gave a keynote yesterday afternoon to close the day. Uh, it's an overview of the industry and sort of hits on some of the themes uh, in my book, but it also contains some new th thinking that I've been doing about VR and what the adoption issues are. So AR is white hot, right? Because it's making the cell phone we already have much better. So that's when technology really succeeds. When technology struggles is when there's not a clear value proposition. And I think VR, I mean, I hope the new devices, right? We've been saying for years, well, if it was wireless, well, if it was plug and play, uh, then VR would hit an inflection point. And I'm actually beginning to think that that is not true. I think the real problem with VR is that there is no readily apparent consumer value proposition. I wrote a column last week, which is VR is waiting for its AOL moment. And what I mean by the AOL moment is it's the moment when the personal computer met online services. And then people said, oh, now I know why I should have a personal computer in my home. They were expensive, they were difficult to use. So in 1994, 13% of American households had a personal computer by 2,050% did, which is an astonishing inflection point. So uh, I, I think those are some of the issues around it. I think all, you know, we say augmented reality, it, it's kind of a silly word because we're really not augmenting reality, we're augmenting ourselves as human beings. We already have with smartphones. And, and that computer that's always with us, it will inevitably become wearable. So, but that is long term. Near term, AR, AR is going to seep insidiously, quietly, and invisibly <coughs> into the apps that we already use. It's going to make Google Maps better. It's going to make social media better. So a consumer is not going to say, oh, wow, I have an augmented reality app. He's going to say, wow, Google Maps is a lot better. I, I like this whole notion that you just presented, sort of this incremental approach, right? Augmented reality is just going to become a cool feature that you're going to use. But you said something uh, in your comment that, that made me think, and, and actually I wanted to ask Mark a question. In your reporting, because you cover a lot of different big companies and you see different inflection points uh, for technologies, are you seeing any inflection points at all uh, in AR or even uh, VR in, in, in the re reporting you've been doing? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. What we saw last year was Apple and Google with ARKit uh, and AR Core sort of create frameworks to standardize a way for companies to build AR applications. We're getting a really mainstream use case with the new Android OS this year with integration of AR inside of Google Maps. You'll essentially be able to open up the map on an Android phone, use turn-by-turn -turn directions, and you hold the phone up, you point it somewhere, and it will actually show you with the phone camera where you are in front of you and then throw up arrows showing you pointing the correct place to walk. That's a real world use case for AR. And I think those are one of the, that's one of the first use cases that's actually going to be something that I personally would use and I think a lot of people in this room would use who normally use turn by turn directions. I can tell you that I have never used an AR application uh, on my phone for, for personal use. I mean, AR kit has been out for, I would say, nine or ten months by well, now. Because it sucks, right? What happened when AR Kit came out, right? We all rushed to the App Store and we downloaded all these AR apps. And we're like, it doesn't do anything. I just, like, play basketball on a, on a table. I mean, how interesting is that, right? It just took a bunch of 2D stuff and put it into real space. And that was sort of the beginning, I think, in a change of thinking about AR because AR by itself is not particularly compelling. We were missing the AR, AR cloud, right? There was no uh, additional information enhancing the world. It wasn't really augmenting anything. And I think that that was sort of a lot of people were like, wow, augmented reality doesn't, it's not automatic just because of the word. Right, there's nothing in the iPhone right now, an AR kit right now that's replacing daily tasks or making daily tasks better. I think the turn by turn AR uh, example is going to be one of the first things that actually will replace something that most people use their phones for. Yeah. 
I'll give a quick story. Over the holiday, um, I used augmented reality to purchase a rug for my office. <laughs> I had my tablet and my girlfriend, and we're picking out the rug. I decided, like, you know what? I wasn't 100% satisfied, so I went to the store. Uh, got to the store, I realized it was the wrong rug because of the material, right? And so AR completely fell down in that case. Mm. It was cool that I could see it in the pattern, and I wound up picking a different one. So there's a lot of reasons why it's interesting, and wow, it brought me and my girlfriend together, and we can sort of plan out the house and the room. But then when it came down to the purchase, purchase itself, it, it, it didn't hold up. Yeah, right? it still I, doesn't work that well for that particular application. Furniture, I feel like, is one of the most easily, if you can envision so easily like how that could be useful um, and how you might use it now and then maybe again later and you know, and, and one of your friends might use it, but it still doesn't work that well. Is I mean, that's the bottom line. I was trying to use it in my living room and it's a pretty big open space where in theory that kind of thing should probably work really well. Um, and it just, you know, I think it was the Ikea app and I'm like, playing with this poor chair and trying to be like, you know, like make it bigger and make it smaller. And it was just a mess. Yeah. So it sounds like we're all in agreement. AR can definitely reduce friction for a lot of regular activities that we're doing, but it's that <coughs> refinement of the technology um, that has to get a bit better before it, we're going to be able to use it full time and it be becomes a natural part of the way that we interact uh, with our technology. Hey, I want to move over to another sort of set of questions. This question's are about some of you in the audience and about some of the vendors here. Um, I'm really curious to know your opinions of some of the big tech vendors and how well they're doing um, with their technology. And let's call them out. We already called out Apple a little bit. I'm curious, um, uh, who wants to maybe give a comment on Microsoft and their um, immersive technology um, uh, uh, efforts with HoloLens, um, uh, with Windows Mixed Reality? I see them as a market leader, not only because of the size of the company and the investment that they've made in graphics over many, many years, uh, but is there something else there? Is there, some, is there another, something else that's going on behind the scenes uh, around personal computing maybe that we haven't really seen yet or you've seen in your reporting that maybe hasn't been revealed yet? Microsoft. Well, I can call out Microsoft because yes. I do it in the book and I like them. Microsoft is kind of the good guys. They're very open to journalists, they're not as cagey and inaccessible as other companies are, uh, and they're not as suspicious as other companies are, which is very, very different uh, than the Microsoft that existed 20 years ago that was you know, always looking for a fight and uh, world domination. They, they are much more open. The entire code base to the HoloLens is on GitHub. I mean, who would do that? Mm -hmm. um, but, but they really believe in the ecosystem. So that's the good Microsoft. Now here's the stupid, shitty Microsoft, where they are trying to appropriate language and they create confusion in the marketplace. A hologram is a three-dimensional image that you see with your naked eye. Look it up. Right? It has nothing to do, that, that it's fake hologram. So they confused that one. They screwed the pooch on that one. And then they came up with this thing, there's something called the Milgram scale. It was created in, in uh, 1994 by uh, two academics called Milgram and Cascino who were trying to understand the relationship of virtual and augmented reality. So they put the physical world on one end of the spectrum and on the other end of the spectrum was fully occluded vir virtual reality. And Microsoft said, oh, we've got something called the Windows mixed reality spectrum. <laughs> and conveniently, here on the reality side, we have the HoloLens. And over here, we have, uh, in the virtual reality side, we have a Windows mixed reality headset. So first of all, who calls a fully occluded VR headset a mixed reality headset? Raise your hand if you are not confused. So that is Microsoft creating confusion. So consumers hate confusion, right? That did not make people want to go out and buy a headset. I will say this about Microsoft. They're a little bit embarrassed about it. But they also will ultimately in some ways have the last laugh because the kind of desktop virtual reality that that product represents is going to be ultimately an interoperable AR and VR headset capable of doing both things. Right now the outward facing cameras are really cheap and you can't do much other than motion detection. But those cameras are coming down in price and ultimately they'll be able to digitize the world and, and integrate digital information into them. So, that, that's calling out Microsoft for me. Um, Rachel, uh, just outside, you were mentioning this, 
one company, and I wanted you to tell that story. Can you repeat uh, what we were talking about uh, in the hallway? Uh, which company? <laughs> the company uh, was... Uh, what kind of thing are we talking about? AR? We, it, was, it was an AR company uh, that you had just... Uh, startup? Uh, Ubiquity 6? Yes. They're, they're doing some really interesting stuff. Um, this is a startup. Uh, one of the guys behind it actually helped... Uh, he was a VC before at Kleiner, and he helped them uh, get their investment in Magic Leap. Um, and he then went off to do his own thing. And basically, he's trying to do what Magic Leap uh, is, is uh, purportedly doing, but on a smartphone today. And so they have some really interesting technology that they've built um, where you can use uh, augmented reality with another person simultaneously and have persistent objects that will stay in place. And you can, for instance, I went into their office one day for an interview. I put a little virtual cat and mouse, and just two 3D objects taken from um, whatever 3D image search they have hooked up to their app. I placed them in a corner of the office, and I came back a few days later to check on my pets, and they were still there. Um, and that kind of thing is still very unusual, I would say, at least from what I've seen, um, just to have objects that are there. Oh, I also put like a Rachel was here banner in the middle of their lobby just to be <laughs> obnoxious. Um, and you can do things like play basketball. We played virtual basketball with each other with the phones. And yeah, that's kind of uh, hard to do and kind of annoying. And it's not the best user interface at this point. But the fact that you can do that in real time and it worked very well, he could see what I'm doing. I could see what he's doing. We built the same basketball hoop. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, could, could we go back to uh, the HoloLens and the headsets for a minute? That was, yeah. Was, was, no, that was very interesting. Thanks. Um, but I, I feel like we should touch upon that some more. Go for it. I think the HoloLens sort of represents a snapshot in time from a hardware perspective of what companies like Apple, Microsoft itself, and Google are working on. Microsoft is just very public about it in the sense that they are, are shipping it now. They're allowing enterprise customers and whatnot to buy it. But it's more representative of their vision for where the MR, AR, VR, XR, whatever R uh, space we're talking about is going to go. I don't think that's their end game, but I think the vision of having sort of a mix of virtual reality and augmented reality is where those, those three big companies are going. Uh, it's very clear that what Apple is working on internally right now is pretty much up to par with a the HoloLens. They're just not gonna come out, come out with it until it's something like what, you know, or something close to what Rachel's wearing, a pair of glasses that you can't really yeah. tell the difference uh, if there's, you know, tech jammed inside of them or not. And, um, you know, this is the direction Facebook is going as well. And I think we should, we should touch upon the, uh, the Oculus Go, the Facebook VR headset, because I really thought before that came out that it would be a game changer for the VR industry solely because of its price, $200, standalone headset, you don't have to put a phone into it. Um, but I've noticed after using it, there are some drawbacks, and that comes down to, to battery life, mm. right? Their performance is good. You watch a, you know, a movie on it on Netflix, you stream it over Wi-Fi. Movies are what two, two and a half hours. You're not gonna, you're probably not even gonna get that much juice out of it on 100% charge. So I think there's a, a ways to go across the board. I, I think mean, there's a, a, sorry, go ahead. And I was gonna say, I think there's a couple things to unpack there. One, the first thing that I thought of with battery life is yes, battery life is very important. Who uses VR continuously for several hours though at this point? Because I frankly cannot use it for nearly that long. And some of it is because these headsets are still just too heavy for right. my head. It gets very uncomfortable and it bothers my eyes. Yeah, and um, I get nauseous from it. Exactly, myself as well. So we're great and terrible testers of these things. Just, just a little factoid about the go. Um, Superdata is uh, predicting they're going to sell 1.8 million units by uh, the end of this year. And uh, you know, people were excited about it. You know, other writers were excited about it. And I was thinking, what the hell is wrong with you people? The Nintendo Switch sold 12 million units in three weeks. Mm -hmm. 1.8 million consumer devices isn't even a business. You got to keep in mind, though, that people are so much more used to that kind of form factor. Yeah, though. of course. So even yeah. though the Nintendo Switch is like a twist on it, mm -hmm. it's still something that, and the whole ecosystem has been in place for, what, decades now, right? So, so this touches on another problem that VR has, right? Because it's viewed Not to defend low sales. <laughs> no, no, but, it, but people view it as a game machine. Exactly. And another factoid, the number one consumer product in satisfaction is game consoles. 
So it's a product to improve games for people who don't need their games improved. And the economics of VR games are terrible because they have a few hours of gameplay for the same price that a console game has that gives you 100 hours of gameplay. So, you know, there are a lot of young people who own them. You know, they're looking for entertainment for $50 or uh, 50 cents or a dollar an hour. And, you know, in VR, it's $5 an hour. So the economic proposition of VR, um, especially in gaming, is terrible. That said, I think, you know, VR will be social. You won't necessarily pay for that. Um, but, uh, but we are far from it because I don't think people think they need VR to be social. They don't, but I think also be, even beyond that, the bottom line is simply that we just don't know what the hell to do with it yet yeah. or what we want to do for more than five minutes with it or what we want to do uh, at five minutes over and over with other people. Yeah, you know, agree. just nobody has, even though I'm really interested in VR, no one has shown me, here's my, I hate to say killer app, but no one has shown me a killer app. So um, one company we haven't mentioned in depth yet is Magic Leap, and mm -hmm. from the material that they've put forward, this is their premise. They want mm -hmm. you to wear the headset all day or for a long time. They have these immersive experiences in your daily life. Anyone care to comment um, on potential viability of sort of that type of AR headset for consumers and or Magic Leap themselves? Well, I just I wrote a story uh, about a month or two ago, a column uh, called an open letter to Magic Leap. No, oh, I saw that. Oh, we all and, saw uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> and uh, in it, I said the following things. First of all, I am very excited about that product, and I am grateful to Roni Abovitz and that entire team for their ambition, and most of all, for their socialization of the idea of a wearable computer. They really started that conversation that has grown from there to, to this, really. Um, and, uh, and I think that's terrific. I, I'm really looking forward to using it. That said, their public positioning, and then we don't know a lot about it, but their public positioning in every announcement they've made, every announcement they've made has been about games. If that is a $2,000 AR game machine, they have lost. It needs to take what we're already doing and make it better. Yes, it should have some fun games, absolutely. But that is not why someone will spend $2,000 on that device. Gamers are satisfied. They don't need the Magic Leap headset to make games better. The Magic Leap headset needs to take what we're already doing and make it better. So I got a tweet from Roni, sent me a message, and he said, it will. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there it is, the guarantee, right? And I, and I, said, <laughs> I said, can I have an invitation? <laughs> no response. I was going to say, no response. silence. <laughs> Anybody else on that? That's a lot of money, right? $2,000 for a device. I mean, look at it this way. What are these headsets supposed to do? They're supposed to replace the phone in your pocket eventually. People are complaining about paying, what, $1,000, $1,100 for an iPhone these days. The Samsung phones are getting up there. The That's a Pixel lot of too. money. Yeah, the Pixel is up there. These VR headsets at $2,000, I mean, that's, that's, that's double the price. Um, and it's just not going to be as good out of the gate. And I guess the question for you is, I mean, when's this thing even going to come out, the Magic Leap? Is it going to come out where you're going to need the puck in your pocket? I mean, is that really what it's going to be? The Creator on? Edition is supposed to come out in 2018. Yeah. Yeah, I'll believe happen. it when I see it. I think what actually may happen is they'll like ship 10,000 developer units and call that the release. Um, and then there'll be a consumer release sometime in 2019. But I think they've lost their, um, their first mover advantage. Right. is gone. And I know Toshiba has a VR headset, which I believe it's Toshiba, that they, is it Toshiba? It's Toshiba. Or Samsung? It's not Samsung, but anyways, um, it's like the VR headset, it's light and whatnot, right? But the, the, you know, the trick is you need to carry basically a portable PC about the size oh, of the Oh, hand. right, right, that's, that's, but it's, an inter but it's for, for enterprise. Right, it's for <laughs> enterprise, and that's where we're at for enterprise. Imagine how long we're going to be so we have something consumery fitting that whole thing into, yeah, into glasses. Right now, it just doesn't seem like any problem is being solved. So um, I've seen I've seen Magic Leap um, myself. It was a while ago, so 
let's assume that it's um, gotten a lot smaller since then, because it was rather large um, at the time. Uh, and it was st a standalone giant. It didn't look like that cool steampunk thing. No, it did <laughs> not look like that. Um, and it was not something like, it was not wearable at that point. So it was fixed, which allows you to um, make certain things look better than you could otherwise. You know, you can hide certain flaws, um, or I wouldn't be able to detect certain, certain things um, be just because of it being stationary. Um, but if we assume that the image quality I saw then, which was several years ago, is somehow able to be packaged into that tiny package, then that would be really awesome. I'd be like, oh my god, this is incredible. Um, 2,000 bucks, you know, still expensive, because like 2,000 bucks is a lot of money to a lot of people. But, but I don't know that that's going to happen. I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. I've spoken to people who have tried it, uh, the uh, developer version, um, and you know, they say it works. But it's impossible to judge from talking to other people because everyone has different expectations of what's workable and what's good and what's not good. You know, one of, one of the big problems with AR headsets and the Magic Leap Two is the small field of view. Exactly, and, that's, and the Hololens has that too. So it still Reg has that. Reggie yeah. Watts said he thought the Hololens was like looking through a slit in the knight's helmet. It, right? it, you have it to is. Position your head so that your eye can see mm -hmm. the image. And, I, and so, of course, people will do that in industry. They'll, you'll do that for, if it's work, but no one is going to accept that as a as consumer product. As being the norm, yeah. My first thought when I tried HoloLens for the first time was it was kind of, I was imagining like looking at an elephant a brick at a time, <laughs> you know, like because you have to keep moving. If you want to see something large or close up, you need to kind of move your head around. And I couldn't imagine anyone doing that. But in Microsoft's defense, they have a fully functional self-contained device. Um, that seems to work fairly reliably, and yeah. you know, it's actually it is functional. So that's a really, really big deal at yeah. this point. Yeah, it's quite a good device uh, for for what it does, even with the limitations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There. Hey, listen. Um, before I ask my next question, I just uh, want to tell everyone we'll take uh, some audience questions at the end, and about 10, 10 minutes from now. Uh, so if you want to use the Slido system to send in a questions, uh, we'll get them in a few minutes. Uh, I want to switch topics uh, really quickly, and ask you about how you guys go about doing your jobs. One, I think one of the reasons people are sitting here is that uh, you have a panel full of reporters, columnists, uh, and analysts, and we investigate the market, but also at the same time, we have a lot of sort of inbound inquiry, inbound pitch. Um, maybe each one of you could just talk for a few minutes around how, um, how companies pitch you, how you take their data, you sort of filter out what you think is not the truth, you get to the salient things, and how, how do you go about sort of receiving those pitches and dealing with them and then turning those into um, interesting topics and articles? So maybe, Mark, would you uh, care to go first since you're quite well known for you know, doing, doing this investigative reporting for a lot of big companies? Well, I'll start with this. Uh, you've gotten me very interested in, in Magic Leap, so I think I should figure out what's going on there. Um, in terms of my workflow, um, decline to comment. Um, just kidding. Um, you know, it's just about you know talking to the right people and developing relationships and and doing a lot of listening, right? I think God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason to, to do more <laughs> listening uh, than talking. Uh, so, well, but the heart uh, of my question was, you know, when you receive this information, how do you make a value judgment on what you think is? you know, what you should believe, what you shouldn't, and especially, and, and I, I didn't sort of say the reason behind this, but with AR, VR, and I think with a lot of technologies, maybe there's vaporware announcements that are made. Those are probably easy to sort of figure out because there's nothing there. But with AR, VR, sometimes it's hard to understand the effectiveness. You right. put on the device, someone that has it, has worn it for the first time, they love it. Someone for me that puts it on, I've been doing it for decades, like, okay, well, I'll need to see more um, improvement before it's right. Now, two different people seeing the same thing, two completely different opinions. Just sort of wondering how you go about making that value judgment. Yeah, so we obviously we get lots and lots of pitches, and by we, I mean, you know, everyone here on stage. Um, I, I really don't do much reading into, you know, pitches and what other people are sending. I sort of go out to these conferences and uh, reach out to people and, and look into the things that I find interesting. Just find, you know, following my own gut on things um, rather than, you know, going through a bunch of emails. I find that uh, much more reliable in terms of figuring out what's next just because there's much less noise. Rachel? 
I can't give away all my secrets, but uh, <laughs> I, um, how do I find stories? How am I, what am I willing to tell you? Um, I mean, a lot yeah. of it is, is probably similar to both of you talking to people. Um, sometimes I find uh, really interesting stories through people. You know, somebody's story, somebody might tell me about somebody else or some other company. Um, even if it's a similar company, sometimes you get cool things that way. Sometimes I find I found some really cool stories randomly on Twitter. Just mm -hmm. someone tweeting about, oh, I just saw a cool X, Y, Z, and I will just look it up. Um, sometimes things will be mentioned as an aside, um, even in another reporter's story. I've seen that before, where they'll mention like so and so, you know, who's starting such and such side project, and it's, the story has nothing to do with that. And I'll be like, oh, what's that? And then that's an interesting story. For ARVR, do you think it's important to take a personal demo? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's you can occasionally write about something that you don't try, and sometimes um, it's impossible um, if it's a research project. I do I find some really cool stories that are still in the research project stage, and either location-wise, that's just impossible, um, uh, or you know, it's just you know they cannot they physically cannot give you a demo for whatever reason. It still might be worth writing about, but then I'll try to at least do like let's do a demo of some sort via Skype video or something. You know, like I try if I can't try it personally, I try to get as close to trying it as I can. Charlie? Well, uh, a couple things. Uh, being the old guy here on this panel, uh, this writing about uh, technology is my fourth career. And so I'm not a regular writer. I am really a business person and an entrepreneur who is writing now. So a lot of what I have to say in my book, a lot of what I have to say in my columns is really about my filter, right? And my filter is uh, technology succeeds when it makes what we're already doing better, faster, and cheaper. People are the killer app. And we always overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term. The other things I will say is I love covering this story. This has all the makings of an epic story because we are talking about an evolutionary change in mankind. Right? We are talking about technology that has already changed the relationship of parents and children, right? because we are way more available to our kids than we ever have been, but we are far less present when we're with them. And we, as you know, technology is also about the law of unintended consequences, and we don't yet know what the consequences of that are going to be, because for 125,000 generations, we had a different relationship with one another than we have today. So we really don't know what's going to happen. And that's what makes a great story. No one knows really what's going to happen. I have theories, and I test them. So one theory is that, that AR and VR are following uh, the adoption and development pattern of the personal computer. I've seen this movie before. I lived through you know, generations of, of disruption. I mean, when I was growing up, you couldn't record music on, on tape. Yep. And then, I was in graduate school before you could record television. So, you know, when VHS and, and Betamax came out in the early 80s, I mean, it was like magic. We were like, oh my God, this is going to change everything. So I have seen this movie before. In terms of choosing what to write about, um, first of all, I want to tell a great story. Right, so what does a great story have? Well, uh, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Sure. It's got um, <laughs> larger-than-life characters, and it teaches us something, by example. So I look for, first of all, things that, that are interesting to me, but then I look for things that, that can be a good story, like I was telling you a story, and, and, uh, you know, and I try and write that way. I try and make it entertaining, and I try and communicate how, on the edge of my seat, I am every day when I get up. So the last question I have before we get to the audience questions for each one of you, um, and I sent this to everyone beforehand because I wanted you to think of the answer, but I'll ask you, what's the coolest AR or VR demo or pitch you've seen recently? Who wants to go first? Let's start on this side. <laughs> um, well, uh, I also... Um, have visited the guys at Ubiquity 6. I'm, I've written a lot about the AR cloud, and uh, there are a lot of companies doing really, really exciting stuff in this area. Um, you know, the persistence of data is a very, very big story, right? The world is going to be painted with data. Every person, every place, 
and everything is going to be painted with data. And the first way we're going to access that data is through the smartphones that are already in our pockets, through the apps that we're already using. Okay. So uh, that is the coolest thing that I'm, I'm looking at right now. AR Cloud. Yes. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, if I'm talking about a specific um, demo or example, I, I guess I'd say Ubiquity 6 is the coolest thing I've seen uh, very recently. I'm, try, I'm going back through my no, mental I, I file. I agree with that. They have some breakthrough it's technology. Just, it's really neat. I mean, the, the imagery needs to be refined um, in, you know, in terms of how amazing the graphics are that you see. But that's, I, I don't see that as but, a huge problem. But there are also some other amazing companies mm -hmm. less Absol visible than absolutely. Ubiquity 6. UAR out of Portland is, is one of them. Sure. Uh, another one is a, a brand new company, 6DAI. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they view themselves as part of the stack. They're not okay. trying to solve the whole solution the way Ubiquity 6 and UAR are doing. But all of these approaches are really compelling. Sure, but as far as things that I've seen, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the yeah. one that I think is yeah. most interesting. I look at it from a very consumer perspective. So what's available on the market today? What can you buy you know, for your family for Christmas or Hanukkah and whatnot? And I think the, the gaming consoles, uh, the PSVR, the HTC Vive, those you know, sub $1,000, they're, they're quite impressive. It's yep. just, it's niche, but uh, from a consumer perspective, it's quite cool. I'll give you mine, since I asked, I have, <laughs> I have my pick. A couple of years ago, I went to Melbourne, Australia, and I demoed zero latency, sort of the walk around VR. Oh, the free roam VR is amazing. Free roam VR cool. is amazing. If you ever have a chance to try the it. Void the Void is really cool. Yeah. Really interesting way of experiencing a virtual yeah. world. I agree with that. So with that, I'm gonna, we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have a few minutes left, if that's okay with everybody. Um, I'm just looking at them here. We have, uh, we, we have them in front of us. So does anybody want to grab one? It says, let me see. I like the privacy yeah, question. Yeah, let's, let's tackle the privacy one. Does anyone on the panel want to tackle this privacy question? It says, I will read, up. is privacy still relevant in the new world of XR? Well, privacy is always relevant. <laughs> yeah, I think that's certainly the lesson we're all learning the hard way, that um, people have been giving away their privacy without a thought to get the benefits of doing that without realizing the unintended consequences that we're bringing on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, th I think people are going to get over it uh, pretty quickly for AR headsets, right? I mean, if you think about it, it's no different than, than carrying a phone, talking on the phone. You know, you have a camera on the back. You could be, you know, pointing it and taking video of anyone. That was the problem with Google Glass, was it not? Having the camera potentially always recording on the front. And I think once these things become ubiquitous, if they become ubiquitous in five years to a decade, it will be become part of the norm, both fortunately and unfortunately. Somebody was telling me about a science fiction novel where people wore masks to prevent themselves from being identified through facial recognition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well those, you know, I'm quite concerned about it, I have to say. Uh, it's more than just the camera, it's depth sensing, and then it's the combination of contextual information that you get from the cloud to sort of put together a data picture of someone that maybe they didn't realize could happen. And it's going to be a bit more intense, I think, once you have these sort of depth sensing capabilities right in your home and you can sort of decode the shape of your very personal items. Yeah. Uh, so I definitely think that there has to be privacy controls built into the system, yeah. even at the silicon level, potentially, much in the same way they do it with smartphones today. I mean, uh, we're right also, here. sorry. Anyway, I was just saying, I, I think that, that the, the, the vendors have to take it pretty seriously. Um, and if they don't, then I'm, I'm concerned that they, the devices won't be as robust and usable if, if it's not there. But you wanted to? I was just thinking about some uh, issues that we're already seeing um, with different, similar but different technology. We're already we're seeing um, with uh, smart speakers that, uh, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, we're just seeing that they're, you know, they are always recording. Or maybe not always, but they're often, you know, they cycle through. And if you say a wake word, then they're saying, wait, I need to pay attention. Um, so if you're like me, for instance, and you have um, an Echo Dot or something like that in your house, um, you can go back and you can see, um, or with uh, Google's assistant, I think you can do the same. You can see what's been recorded. And when I was looking just last week, I was really surprised by, I mean, it has recorded all kinds of things that had nothing to do with Alexa. Me talking about work, um, my toddler just talking. Like, not, you know, no one directing it toward a specific place. And that made me think about uh, also things with AR and with VR as well. Just, you know, if we're going to be recording things, uh, data is going to be recorded and stored remotely. We have to think really hard about whether we want that to be happening all the time. 
All right, thanks a lot. That's going to have to be our last question, even though we received many more. Uh, we're out of time. I want to say thanks very much to the panelists. Uh, thanks to the conference for having us. And uh, we'll see you on the show floor.